Hi everybody, welcome to my channel. If you don't know who I am, uh, my name is Lindsay. I'm a registered nurse. I'll link um, to a video above about um, all about me and my experience with dementia patients. So today, since it is almost Halloween, I decided that I'm going to do stories of the demented. So this is um, multiple stories that I've had over the years. I've been working with dementia patients for about 15 years. So that sounds like a lot of time. Um, and I'm only 32. So I started out when I was 17, I was 18 with dementia patients. And now I am 32. Um, so I have had a lot of experiences over, um, over the years. <laughs> of working with dementia patients. But I figured um, since we are almost at Halloween, I have my Halloween uh, scrubs on and we are going to talk about some of the stories that I've had with dementia patients. So in the comments below, let me know your story. Um, the funniest thing that you've ever seen with uh, dementia patients. And then I will actually read the comments and I may do a video of um, some of your stories below. So uh, leave me um, some of your stories below or comments below of some things that you have seen over the years, either if you're a caregiver working with dementia patients or you are a, um, a caregiver of a dementia patient, one of your loved ones, um, let me know and I, will, I may feature you on another video. So there's a whole bunch of stories that I could tell you. We should have written a book years ago. I actually may write a book. Um, so I started out with adult daycare. And it's so funny because <clears throat> everything that we have experienced, um, they the nurses, so I was a CNA at the time, and the nurses were like, you cannot make this shit up. You cannot, like, we have to write a book on this. But we never did it. Like, nobody ever did it because we were so busy um, you know, taking care of them. So let me tell you about a couple things. So when I was 17, almost 18, so I turned, so my birthday's in at the end of June and I had to be 18 to work at, um, adult daycare. I was 17 when I graduated high school. I was a CNA at that time, but I had to be 18 to work at adult daycare. So I had to wait, um, to apply. So I applied um, sometime around my birthday and I got hired fairly soon after that because they needed caregiver or they needed CNAs. So I worked at an adult daycare and the first, I think it was like the first day, the first day or two that I worked at the adult daycare with, of all, with all of our dementia patients, we had um, an older lady who uh, didn't know where she was, what was going on. And we were playing with puzzles and doing some kind of activities. And she was over there somewhere. I remember her name was Sarah. She's very cute, <laughs> very cute older lady, but she actually pooped in a bucket. She thought that the bucket was um, a toilet uh, because at that time, like you don't know, like your brain is so jumbled when you have dementia, you don't know anything at all. So she thought that the bucket was um, a toilet. Or maybe back in the day, she had known a bucket as what the, they went to the bathroom with. If they had like outhouses or something, we do have those people. Those are some of the people that we take care of to this day. So I don't really know why she went poop in the bucket, but we, we, it's a locked unit. So they can't get out anywhere. Um, and there are like bathrooms, but obviously she didn't know where the bathroom was. She didn't ask any of us she pooped and she took her pants down and pooped in the bucket. So I didn't have to clean that up because I was like, oh, and I was so scared <laughs> of her like pooping in a bucket. And now I just laugh at it. Like, you know, it's poop, whatever you'll clean it up. It's fine. Um, but that was one of my first experiences is that this woman, like my first day or two, um, that I was there, she pooped in a bucket and I was like, what did I get myself into? <laughs> so, at the course of being at adult daycare, um, we had lots of experiences, lots of different families coming in, lots of different patients coming in, different backgrounds. 
Um, you know, some of them were poor, some of them were rich, some of them had played in the NFL, uh, some of them were CEOs, some of them, you know, way back when. I mean, we had the gamut of people. So actually the same woman um, who pooped in the bucket, uh, I was trying to get her in, excuse me, for lunchtime. I remember at one time I was trying to get her in for lunchtime and she, I said, Miss Sarah, can you come in because we're going to serve lunch? And I went to put my arm on her arm to touch her. So, you know, the use of touch is good, but you have to watch out for who you're doing it to. So I put my hand on her arm and I said, Miss Sarah, it's time to come in for lunch. And I was patting her on her arm. Miss Sarah, it's time to come in for lunch. And she looked straight at me and said, don't you do that to me. And she slapped me on the butt. She spanked me. <laughs> I was like, whoa, I just got spanked. Like she thought I was her kid. So you may get this where your voice or your face reminds them of their family and it is comforting it is very comforting to them you know sometimes people react differently to people just like we do in everyday uh society some people will take comfort to them knowing that your voice or your facial features remind them of their family member their loved one that was close to them and so they may uh, attach more to you some of them may not like you for one reason or another, and you just have to learn to not take that personally, learn to stay away from them. Um, if you have to, you know, help them with something, bring another coworker of yours or bring someone else that can help you because you don't know what they're going to do. Number one, they have dementia and number two, they don't like you for whatever reason. So you don't know what they're going to do. So I would tell you, if you have one of those people, or if you're in that situation, make sure that you bring someone else with you, or if in fact that someone else could go towards them instead of you going, that will avoid the situation um, at all costs. So she spanked me, and this woman spanked me, um, and I kind of thought it was funny, I thought it was hilarious, and um, you know, nothing happened, it was, it was like a very, you know, nonchalant thing, but she thought that I was her. I guess one of her kids or something, um, because I told her to come in for lunch and she is older that she's always older than me, but in her mind too, you know, I wasn't trying to help her at that point. She just thought, um, you know, you're not going to talk to me like that because I am older than you and you respect your elders. So <laughs> she spanked me. We eventually got her back in and she was fine. Same woman actually uh speaking about co-workers that that they don't like this one girl that i worked with had a very high-pitched voice whereas i have a very low-pitched voice and i'm loud so my voice projects and a lot of older people like me for that reason because they have hard time hearing and a lot of them don't want to wear hearing aids for whatever reason so when i talk to them i had like i'll talk to you now how i talked it and i would say like Hi, Mr. Jones. How you doing today? My name is Lindsay. Can I help you out with your food? And they'll be like, oh, yeah, sure. And then I always say, like, I always apologize. I'm like, I'm sorry. I have a really loud voice. This is just how I talk. And they're like, no, you're fine. I can actually hear you. So a lot of older people like me because I have a very low voice and it projects out where they don't need a hearing aid. Now, there are some people that have like high pitched voices that are softer. Um, same woman that spanked me, same woman that pooped in the butt bucket um, actually cornered uh, one of the nurses and put her hands around her neck. Um, and I don't know what she said. I wasn't there at that moment, but it scared the nurse to death. Um, and that woman didn't like her for whatever reason. So she didn't necessarily not like me. She just didn't like me at that moment, but I never had an interaction like her, like that with her. So again, like if you're in a facility, you just have to realize like who you're talking to, who you're interacting with, if they like you, if they don't, 
Um, and just make sure that you have a coworker or someone there with you at all times with any of them, because at any moment they could snap just like any of us when we get irritated or, or someone says something to us that we don't like, you know, we could go off in a second. So can they, um, but you don't realize actually how much strength that they have, um, until they actually grab you around the wrist or grab you around the neck or something like that. So I was sitting next to somebody who, um, I guess didn't like the way I was talking to them or something, thought I was being loud and grabbed my hand, my wrist. And it actually did really hurt. It didn't leave any marks, but it did really hurt. Um, so for those types of things like this, I'm talking about back in the day. So this was 15 years ago. Um, and we didn't really do anything or 14 years ago. Um, they kind of wrote it up in their chart, like the incident that happened. And sometimes they would fill out an incident report depending on um, what the situation was. But if it was like something like that, they don't really, they kind of note it in their chart, like Lindsay was grabbed by so-and-so, you know, whatever. But they don't really do anything about that. Um, so we also had another incident. This is all from adult daycare. So I have so many stories of adult daycare. It's, it's crazy. Um, and things that happen. And so it's almost like, um, a kid daycare, but with adults that are heavier, bigger, stronger, and just have disabilities. Um, so you, you have to try to keep an eye on them 24 seven. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of movement around the facility. There's all kinds of things going on at the same time. So you're not going to always have track of everyone. And there was 10, 10 of us, um, 10 staff members. I mean, there's an activity director. There's two nurses. There's four CNAs. That's seven. There's a cleaning person. There's the director. That's nine. There's nine people, there's nine people there, but you're not always going to be able to control that. And we had about, I'd say 30, 30 people we had. Um, and sometimes, you know, the numbers go up and down depending on like the day, and uh, the day of the week, what's going on. And we would take them on field trips too. Um, so we also had at the facility, um, one of my coworkers was trying to, um, <laughs> was trying to cook a pizza and instead she she was trying to lessen up the dishes because not only did we have to cook for the people and serve them but we had to clean up and 30 people and there's three people in the kitchen there's one out on the floor um you know it's a lot lot of stuff going on so she tried to um lessen the dishes and she put the pizza in the cardboard right in the oven and it didn't catch on fire, but it made the smoke alarms go off. So we all had to evacuate. It was freezing cold outside. So we all had to evacuate. So we're getting jackets. We're pushing all of them. The fire department had to come in. The fire, the fire chief had to come in and clear the building because it's a county owned building. So they have to have the inspector there from the county. They have to have the fire chief there. The fire department was there. The cops came. They had to tape it off and we all had to stand out in the parking lot. And it was freezing that day. So after all that rigmarole was over, you know, everything was fine that day. The next day we actually went on a field trip. So we took them bowling to the movies. Uh, we would take them to, oh, we would have this um, buffet that we would go to, and then we would have uh, the Dollar Tree. So we ended up doing like the buffet and Dollar Tree on one day where we would go eat out. We would do bowling one day. We did the movies one time. Um, so we tried to get them out and about in the community. So when we were unloading, so we had already gone on the field trip and we were unloading everyone. And one of our clients was in a wheelchair. She had a stroke. So we thought one of the, the other clients try to take care of everyone. Like everybody tries to take care of everybody at some point. So we had one of the clients that was in the wheelchair. One of the other clients we thought was standing with her and had the wheelchair locked. And so we're trying to get everybody off the bus, depending on their disability, whether we needed to use the wheelchair ramp or 
um, have them come down the stairs, but then again, you have to have somebody in front of them and back of them, depending on, you know, if they're a big fall risk or what's going to happen. So we're trying to get everybody off the bus. This one woman, we thought that her wheelchair was locked and there was a little hill. It wasn't a big hill, but there was a little hill going down. Well, nobody was paying attention to her because we all thought she was good to go because she can lock her own wheelchair. She thought that one of the other clients was in the back of her holding her wheelchair, so she let go. And when she let go, her wheelchair went down the hill and actually ran into our boss's car, who <laughs> she had a white car. And this woman is a big woman, very tall, big, like bulky. She's not like that she's just big. She's a big woman and she's very tall. I think she was six three and she had a stroke, so she had gained weight because she's in a wheelchair. She can't move the left side of her body. So she uh went down the hill into our boss's car. And none of us were there at the time because we were all trying to get everyone else to unload. And then when we saw her at the end of the hill, we were like, Miss Mary, what happened? And it all just unraveled. So we didn't get in trouble. So we didn't get in trouble, but, uh, you know, we had to write it as an incident report because um, she went down the hill. So it was just an experience. One of my other coworkers was literally on the floor rolling around laughing so much she had tears in her eyes you know she was just on the floor laughing because she actually saw it we did not um i kind of wish that i would have seen it but on the other hand i probably would have freaked out so all these stories that i'm telling you you know in the dementia world when you work with dementia patients you're either going to laugh or you're going to cry because there's so much chaos that goes on there's so much um unknown there's so many dynamics of a dementia patient and what you're doing on a daily basis for them. You have more bad days than good. Um, hopefully we can get the good ways to overpower the bad, but there's always something going on with dementia patients. So you're either going to laugh or you're going to cry. So if you've never had experience with dementia patients, I would urge you to not judge me or not judge people that have had experience with dementia patients because this is the way it is. You're either going to laugh about stuff that has happened or you're going to cry because it's so stressful and there's nothing you can do. There's nothing in your power because their mind is gone. Their mind, it's not going to get better. It can be managed with some medications that I will talk about in another video, but it's not going to go away and it's always going to progress. So you're not going to get any better. Just like if you were to have diabetes, like type two diabetes, you may able, you may able, you may be able to um, stop it and erase it because you have fixed your diet, you have lost weight, you have controlled other things that were going on in your body. But with dementia, you're never going to stop it. It's always going to progress. You can slow the progression with some medications, but you're never going to stop it. So. You have to have the type of personality to go with the flow and to figure out how you can laugh about the situations and make sure everybody's okay um, versus crying and be stressed out and worried about what's going to happen next because there's always going to be a next. Um, if something bad doesn't happen today, that's great. But tomorrow when they wake up, you could have a whole cluster of things, uh, you know, a cluster of information and I will spare you that word that I was going to say. So that's with adult daycare. Now I have had so many different experiences with people. Um, so the past place that I used to work at, uh, so I got laid off because of COVID um, and I could have gotten a job anywhere. I'm a registered nurse. They need nurses, but I chose not to uh, because I have also a six-year-old. Um, so the place that I had just uh, come from that I was a nurse that I was the only nurse on staff. I had um, 20 some caregivers and we had 30 some clients. Um, 
And it kind of just depends. Like we, we had a in-home non-medical services that we provided. So that means that, um, excuse me, I'm not working with people that have wound care or diabetes or need a specialist for something or have a trach or a peg tube or any of the very invasive medical things that people have. We are working with um, older adults that just need some light house cleaning, uh, somebody to take over their shopping or fix them meals or remind them about their medications. We do have overnight caregivers. We do have caregivers that work 12 hour shifts, but we're not dealing with the big invasive things. So the place that I just worked at, I would go out to the houses and assess people. Now, what I'm about to tell you is uh, very traumatic and it might be traumatic for some people. So just keep that in mind. I had a woman that was actually part of the Holocaust and that was a survivor. She has a lot of depression and I don't even know. So I got laid off. I don't even know how she's surviving right now because she had one caregiver that she really attached to uh, that was actually older than she was and walked worse than the client did. Um, so I don't even know what's going on with that situation. But I had a client that was part of the Holocaust and she has a lot of depression. She has a lot of anxiety and she has a lot of PTSD and a lot of trauma from the past. So she was uh, born out of the Holocaust and she fled to another country. I don't remember what country she said, but she got um, separated from her, her parents and her siblings and she ended up... Um, going to like a foster family, but that was back in the 1930s, I would assume, um, 1930, maybe 1935. So she was, she had a, she said she had a very rough childhood. She never experienced the love that she should have. She never experienced the family dynamic. I think she was abused a lot. Um, there was a lot of things that happened. And then in her uh, time growing up, not just growing up, but when she was an adult, she was in an abusive relationship. She had an alcoholic husband that was killed doing something. She had a son that was killed. She has another son that um, is gay. And I guess she doesn't recognize that or, or acknowledge it is the better word. Uh, because the, the way that she grew up, it's not, I guess that wasn't acceptable back in the day. I mean, I personally don't care, but I can't project my feelings and information onto her. So I just sit there and listen. But she had a lot of depression and a lot of anxiety. She is medicated for it. She has a son that uh, helps her out with it. Um, and that's why we have a caregiver in the house. But she has told me that, you know, there's things that get triggered. So she's Jewish um, and she goes to play Marjan, but she's very antisocial. So I'm sure they're not doing that now because of COVID. But when she would go to play Marjan, they would have to play in groups. I guess you play with four people. I'm not really sure how Marjan works, but it's a very popular um, card game in the Jewish community. And we um, somehow we got a lot of Jewish clients. I guess that's just where the population is, where I was working. Um, so she went to go play Marjan, and I guess she did not feel comfortable with what the other people were talking about, the other ladies were talking about, even though they're all Jewish, she felt uncomfortable with the other ladies and she, she is antisocial, but she said she could not, um, stop the card game because you, you have to play with four people and the card game was very, um, important to her, but she did not like what they were talking about and it triggered her past memories, it triggered her PTSD, it triggered you know, all kinds of stuff that came up for her. So she didn't know what to do. So I was talking to her about it and just saying, you know, is there a way that you can go to Marjan on a different day that those ladies aren't there? Or can you ask them to please change the subject? Or she didn't want to be mean. 
Um, but then there comes a point where, you know, is her playing Marjan uh, beneficial to her and her mental health versus, you know, her going out and seeking people, but then they're talking about things that she can't handle, she doesn't like, and then she's overly, uh, you know, she's overly stimulated by that. And then her mind just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going because she lives alone. So she has a little bit of forgetfulness. She's not, she's not there with dementia yet. Um, but she has a little bit of forgetfulness, but then she's also triggered. So, you know, there's people with dementia that don't know where they are here and now they don't know their reality now but they remember what happened 50 years ago. So you still have to worry about that and think about that when you are talking to them. So I had another, uh, I had a guy, there's two other people um, that I wanna talk about. So I had a guy, they were both from adult daycare, back to adult daycare, they were both from adult daycare. So we had a guy that had Lyme's disease and dementia. And somehow the Lyme's disease triggered in his brain and he could not talk anymore at all, period. He did not talk. Um, I forgot his name, but he was in a medical journal from Massachusetts because of all of the stuff that was going on from him with him. And it was solely because of um, Lyme's disease and then it affected his brain so much that it went to dementia. Now he could not talk at all. He would just sit there and he would, he would like mumble. And he would just do that all day, back and forth, back and forth. Now his wife came in and she said, put him at the piano because they have a piano at home. He started playing piano. And he started singing, you are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you. Oh, please don't take my sunshine away. And he could sing that song and he could do it on the piano. I wish that I had a recording of that, but because of HIPAA, we couldn't do all that. Um, I wish that I had a recording of that because he could sing that whole song, that whole song that I just sang. He sang that whole song and he was on the piano. But if you sit him in a chair, he would go. Mm -hmm. And then he would try to get out of the doors as well because he didn't really know what to do with himself. He couldn't talk to anybody else. He couldn't interact with anybody else, but he could sing that song. It was amazing. I loved it. Now, we also had another guy. He played in the NFL in the 70s. So at that time, they didn't have the helmets and all that stuff like they do now. And they didn't check for concussions and they didn't really know about the, um, I forget what the syndrome is, but the, the brain, um, after football players and, you know, they, they just didn't know all the, uh, stuff that was going to go on with football players mind. So at that time, um, when he was a football player, he played in the NFL. I don't even know if it was the NFL then, I guess it was, but in the seventies, when he played, they didn't have the helmets. They didn't have the equipment that they had now. So we got him because he was around my area. Um, and his wife needed some respite care because, um, she just found it very hard to uh, control him and, you know, do everything for him because he couldn't talk. He could hardly walk. Um, and he just, he had no clue of anything. He didn't know where he was at all. Like he just, there was nothing here, nothing. And we had a very hard time with him because he couldn't even sit in a chair he would sit on the arms of the chair and we would have to turn him around and say, okay, uh, Mr. Jones, we need you to sit in the seat of the chair. And he would just sit there and he had a medical bracelet on and he would eat with the other people. He didn't know how to put his fork in his mouth. 
But other than that, he had no interaction whatsoever. And I don't know if he's still living or not. Um, but he had a very hard time with everything. So that in itself sucks because you've seen this guy. So you've seen this guy progress from, you know, a, a football player and in the NFL and he had kids and he was with his wife for a long time. And now he can't talk at all. And he can't even decipher how to sit in a chair correctly. So it's very sad, some of these stories. Some of these stories are funny. Some of these stories are sad about what I've experienced in my time with working with dementia patients. Um, and you, you know, you see all kinds of stories. And so with all these stories that I'm telling you, just understand that even if there's a lot of people that don't like the elderly or don't want to take care of them, I don't know why. Um, and there's a lot of people that think like the elderly are gross or something, but you have to remember that these people had lives before they were all jumbled and don't know anything from anything. Now, these people had lives. These people had families. These people, some of them were major, major people, like had great careers, made tons of money. And some of them now can't even understand how to sit in a chair correctly or can't tell you what their name is or what their spouse's name is or what their children's name is or where they live. Um, and some of them see their husband or something from 20 years ago that isn't even here. Um, but you have to understand that their minds, their brain is so jumbled. And so there's a lot of people I know, not that I personally know, but that I've seen that just hate the elderly. And I don't get it because all these people have stories, just like you have a story. All of these people have stories of who they were back when, before their brain was all jumbled. So just know if you come in contact with somebody that, you know, their brain is jumbled or they have dementia or something, just treat them nicely because they were at one time. Uh, you know, they had children, they had a house, they had, um, you know, uh, I don't know, maybe major money, maybe possibly, you know, they, they had some kind of functioning life and now their life is declining. Um, so, you know, everybody's going to die at some point, but sometimes dementia patients live, they live for a while and you have to take care of them. And sometimes it gets frustrating if you're the caregiver or the caretaker. Um, but it also sometimes, you know, for you to see somebody outdoors that, you know, you're like, Ooh, what happened to them? Or, you know, they have dementia and they don't recognize anything now. And you're like, why? Because you don't understand. You have to understand that, uh, there's a lot of dementia patients out there that are like just being diagnosed now or you know their families are going through this so if you are somebody that um, is watching that video that hasn't taken care of dementia patients make sure that you look at them in a different light now and that you are nicer to them if you come in contact with them because they're not all you know stinky gross have urine poop on them whatever your brain thinks about dementia patients they've all had lives and stories before they had dementia and they were all important people. They still are important people. And you just have to recognize they're not gross. They're just older. And we are all, I hope one day that I get to be old. I hope I don't have dementia, but I don't know. You know, none of us know what's ahead of us. So if you come in contact with a dementia patient, um, and you haven't dealt with a dementia patient before, just smile and say, hi, how you doing? You know, that's all you have to do. You don't have to think that they're gross or judge them for what they're wearing or who they're with or how come they can't speak right or how come they don't know, you know, their purse is on their left hand and they think, you know, they're in outer space somewhere. Don't judge them. Just say, hi, how you doing? Bye. That's all you have to say. Um, I have lots of stories. So this is all I can come up with right now, but I have lots of stories that I'm going to tell you about my experiences with the dementia population. 
So if you love this video, like, comment, subscribe to my page. If you have a story that you would like to tell me, leave it in the comments below and I will potentially feature you on one of my videos. I'm going to be doing a lot of these videos. I want to hear feedback, you know, um, working with the dementia population. I personally love dementia patients. I personally love the geriatric population. I always have, but there's a lot of people who don't, or a lot of people who have a lack of knowledge. So they may not like the elderly, but just for a reason that they have a lack of knowledge of what to do when you're around an elderly person. So if you have any comments for me, if you have any stories that you've experienced, if you have any questions for me, leave it in the comments below. I will answer your questions and I could potentially feature you on one of my videos. Bye guys.